Welcome back. Security fundamentals. More security. We're going to talk about some more security. And we're going to give you some demos this time. First module, really just informational. Overview, getting into the content. Yep. Ramping up a little bit. This one will get some more hands-on for you. Uh, module two, authentication, authorization, and accounting. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, I don't want to say a lot of people, I won't, I won't assume that. Uh, the difference between authentication and authorization we're going to talk about, it's, it's a very important distinction to know. And accounting, accounting is done by auditing. Yeah. So we, we talk about accounting, but we perform account, the action of accounting through auditing yep. in the system. Oh, Christopher, I'm Thomas Willingham. This is Christopher Chapman. Oh, yeah, I'm Christopher. Oh, yeah, we're, we're not we're on camera, here, so we don't oh, talk we're about not it. On, oh, there we are. There, hi. Thomas Willingham, Christopher Chapman. We're here to help you, to facilitate your learning of this content. Or to annoy you and make you not want to learn any more about security, which hopefully is not the case. Well, I, I would. that's hurtful. No, I'm, I'm not saying it's what we're, we're doing. Annoying. I'm just saying that there may be people out there who are like, oh, these guys are funny and educational. I don't, I don't need all this. <laughs> Oh, this is they fun. Don't I, the, yeah, I don't want to do this. Th that's true. I just want to learn. I don't want to have a good time. Exactly. Boo. Okay, so you stay off my lawn, peoples. Maybe this isn't the course for you. It's possible. It's very possible. <laughs> okay, that's module. A good, that's a good analogy. Yeah, module overview. We're going to talk about authentication, authorization, auditing, which is how we perform accounting, and encryption. So, authentication. Authentication is the process of identifying a unique individual based on a username or password is one system or a username and some type of challenging pass system. User can authenticate using one of the one or more of the following methods. Uh, password or PIN, personal identification number. Uh, if you have a bank card, or you have your phone locked, you're familiar with a PIN. Uh, what a user owns or possesses, such as like a passport, a smart card, an ID card, a badge of some kind, or what a user is, including biometric factors, fingerprints, retinal scans, voice imprints, uh, saliva, DNA, whatever it is Pretty you're much. using to authenticate said person. So those, those three things, what a user knows, has, or is. The, again, the idea is to uniquely identify a person. So you are who you say you are. The most common method of authentication with computers is using a password. Password is a secret secret series of characters that enables users to access a file computer or program or you could use a pin a personal identification number a numeric password shared between a user and system used to authenticate the person oh really quick uh, password we'll talk a bit more about passwords later when we talk about like password policies mm -hmm. and lockouts and yep. how we protect passwords within the system or control what their control what passwords are or should be exactly some degree, yep. digital certificate so a digital certificate is an electronic document that contains an identity of some kind such as an organization or a corresponding public key so as you go to access uh, a resource information content uh, they may request a certificate. You hand them the certificate. It verifies who you say you are. Yep. And it's, it's third-party based, really. It's not that the certificate proves you who are who you say you are. It's that the person who issued the certificate has done that validation and said you are who you say you are. Correct. So again, one of the tricks with certificates, and I just had this experience last week in a massive restructuring of part of what I'm doing at home with some of the servers I've got, is... For certificates to work, you have to trust the issuing party. And that's a whole other conversation for, in this case, series of courses because certificates are. Certificates are is huge. Yeah. It's, it's totally huge. But it is a way. In this case, it is a way to authenticate who you are, to validate who you are. 
So digital certificates, smart cards. Smart cards can also be used. So basically you have your little card. Uh, notice in the diagram here, it has a little uh, circuitry to it. As you put it in, the computer uh, runs, runs uh, verifies the card. You either authenticate or you don't. You may, after you use your smart card, uh, if you're using your computer, maybe challenge for a PIN. So there may be multiple levels of security as you use your badge. Or it could be you're scanning your badge to get into a building or access parking or... One thing I haven't, I don't think is in here is what if you do have a card, which is something you have, and you get prompted for a PIN, which is something you know. What is that called? Well, multi-stage authentication. Multi-stage or multi-factor authentication, which is a phrase you may hear more and more as time goes by. In fact, nope, I can't, I can't talk about that, actually. Never mind. I was going to talk about something awesome, but I can't. Why not? Because it's not around yet. Oh. But for the sake of security, multi-factor authentication is the combination of these, those three things. What a person is, knows, or has. You put in a smart card and you get prompted for a pin. Security token or a hardware token. So this is a little fob possibly that has a unique password in it or a unique uh, numeric combination. And as you go to access the system, it prompts you. And this stuff changes like all the time. I, depending on the system, it may change every five seconds, every minute every hour, whatever, but this changes periodically. So these are synchronized, it knows what your account is. So when it prompts you for the password, you look at it, type in the number at that time, you access the system at another time, a different date and time, that number can be totally different. Oh, 60 seconds later, that number can be totally different. Totally, exactly, exactly. Biometrics, so this is part of your physicality. There's uh, physiological uh, biometrics and then behavioral biometrics. So phys physiological biometrics, uh, part of your face, your retina, your fingerprint, your hand, your iris, DNA, saliva, tongue print, however fancy they want to get. Um, tongue print scanners. Tongue print. I wait for the day. Oh, I don't. It's special. Hopefully that's not shared. <laughs> that was funny. As soon as you said that, I'm thinking, would you put like a little bottle of antibacterial next to it? <laughs> so, you so, could, you could, so you could swab it? Well, that and your tongue. You'd have to, yeah, you'd have to, ugh. Yeah, Whoa. that doesn't, woof. Okay. <laughs> Someone out there somewhere is working on this. You know, <laughs> you know it's coming. Just because we have the idea doesn't mean that people need to create it. Not ide all ideas are good. <laughs> true, true. Behavioral. So, like keystrokes, so a password, uh, signature, your, your name, or your voice. All examples of biometrics. Active Directory. Huh. What if I wanted to know more information about Active Directory? Is there resources available to me? There are. So Active Directory, we're going to cover it a very, very high level, very light level in this course because, again, it's gigantic. Active Directory is the basis for Microsoft. I don't want to say basis for Microsoft Networks. I mean, essentially directory for, services. for controlling resources. Yeah, it's, it's massive. It's days and days and days of learning, years and years and years of hands-on. It's gigantic. We're going to be very, very light in this course on Active Directory. But why it comes up here is because on a centralized network, you want to be sure to keep that information centralized so that it can be used by multiple devices, multiple locations, anywhere. I can use my smart card because the data is centralized somewhere to access my laptop, to access any other laptop or any other computer that has a card reader, or to use the doors in the buildings because it's centralized information. So Active Directory is here to talk about centralizing that data. In this case, usernames, passwords is the best example. So before directory services, Active Directory is Active Directory domain services is Microsoft's implementation of a directory service. Yep. Before directory services, every server that you wanted to access had a unique username and password that you had to enter. So you had a unique ID, you had a unique uh, challenge accept system that you would have to for that system. Uh, directory services enable 
a more global system of interaction. So a directory service stores, organizes, and provides access within a directory and access to resources, resources and information. Active Directory is a technology created, well, Active Directory Domain Services is a technology created by Microsoft that provides a variety of services, including LDAP, Kerberos-based, and single sign-on authentication. So now I can sign on once and I can access servers, I can access my email, I can access internal web servers, uh, I can access a variety of content using my single username password. It also has DNS-based naming and other network information associated with it. Domain controller. A domain controller is a Windows server that basically manages Active Directory domain services. Uh, it replicates account and security information to other uh, systems, other domain controllers on the system. Remember uh, availability and integrity. So multiple domain controllers enable availability. So if one domain controller is either not in my locale, is either far away or goes down and I don't have access to, multiple domain controllers still enable me access to my content and resources. A server not running as a domain controller is known as a member server. NTLM, uh, the default authentication protocol for Windows NT. Standalone computers not part of a domain or when you're authenticating to a server using an IP address. Uh, it also it acts as fallback authentication if it can't complete Kerberos authentication, such as being blocked by a firewall. We'll talk about firewalls in a bit. And it uses, NTLM uses a challenge response mechanism for authentication in which clients are able to prove their identities without sending a password to the server. Yeah, we get into, you could talk about hashing when you talk about NTLM and challenge response. You're never actually sending your password anywhere. Uh, it's, again, another topic, we get into encryption, we get into certificates, in this case, not certificates, but just the security mechanisms exist, just know that hashing is part of this. We'll talk about hashing a little bit in a couple of minutes, I do believe. Kerberos. Uh, Kerberos security and authentication is based on a secret key technology where every host on the network has its own secret key. The key distribution center maintains a database of secret keys, the key master, as it were. For all of this to work and to ensure security, the domains, controllers, and clients must have the same time because part of that secret key is time encoded. Yep. So they need to all ensure that they have the same. You like that key master, well, don't you? Well, I'm giggling because key master is a reference to one of the greatest movies ever made. Oh, it was? Hmm. It was indeed. Very I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm going to see if people can find it. Yep. Uh, but I can make a hint. One of the stars of that movie was interviewed yesterday before the Super Bowl. I missed that interview. You must have, because it happened. Oh. By the way, Super Bowl was yesterday. Just throwing that out there. Yes. For any people uh, in the U.S. or anywhere else who know what Super Bowl is, it was a very big deal for us here in the Redmond, Washington area. Uh, Saturday Night Live did a thing where... Uh, since they weren't on Fox, they weren't enabled to use the title Super Bowl. So some other titles that may give you information about this, uh, Super Fantastic Football Event, uh, Major Football Event to End All. Uh, so basically, it's a big deal in American football. Yes. Active Directory Objects. So the act, act, in Active Directory, I sound like the Martian from When Mars Attacks there. I kind of act, act, act a couple times. Sorry about that. Uh, the Active Directory Objects. Active Directory is made, by, made up of objects and resources. An object is made up of properties and resources. So examples of objects on there are a user, a computer, an organizational unit. These have... Oh, not resources and properties, properties and attributes. So the property of a user could be username, uh, last name, first name, building, telephone number. So all these unique properties make up a user. 
And when you talk about schema of a database, a schema refers to these properties and attributes are these objects. Function of a schema, learn something about database technologies, not even listed. Da we, database technologies aren't even talked about in this course, and yet we're just throwing knowledge out left we and are. right. We are. That's, that's how much we care. This is what we do all the time. Users represents a person who needs access to network resources, contains attributes assigned to individuals, as I mentioned, name, phone, number, email address, password. Well-timed, well-timed. Groups. A group is a collection or a list of user accounts and computers. Uh, they're different from a container. A container is typically a management area, a management separation or a logical management entity. A group is more a collection of resources for a common goal of some kind, uh, to enable rights of some kind, to enable permissions of some kind. I'm throwing out rights and permissions. I'm foreshadowing a little bit. We'll talk about rights and permissions here in a bit. The advantage of using groups is to simplify uh, administration, especially assigning rights and permissions. Uh, to just do a simple exercise, is it easier to assign permissions to 100 users or one group? I'll let you do the math. Also, when you have somebody new come into the organization, uh, instead of ensuring that they have all the unique uh, rights and permissions that they need to perform their function, you just throw them into an appropriate group. You throw them into the accounting group or the CAD group or the printers group or the whatever and know that that group is already set up so when you associate that person to the group, they get all the appropriate permissions. The joy of groups. Groups are great. Uh, in Windows Active Directory, there are actually two types of groups, a security group and a distribution group. And no matter if it is a security or distribution group, it's characterized by its scope within the Active Directory. So the scope could be domain, tree, or forest. Uh, it could be a domain local group, a global group, or a universal group. And again, a domain, tree, or forest. Organizational units. As I mentioned, uh, organizational unit is kind of a management entity. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as OUs. Think of this, an easy way to think about this is either uh, folders in a file cabinet. So instead of having all your paperwork just thrown in the file cabinet, we separate our paperwork by folders to create a method of organization or files in a directory or folders within a directory structure. I will caveat that and one of the recommendations for using OUs in Active Directory is not to use them, and I hate to say this because it's kind of contrary to what you just said, but I'm going to qualify it, not to use them as a means of organization only, which is funny because they're called organizational units. But in an Active Directory or in a directory service, you don't necessarily want to use OUs just to divide groups of users into finance and HR. I mean, if you're just using it to separate those user accounts so you can see them easier, you shouldn't use OUs. No, no. OUs are used to, they're sort of like groups. And we haven't talked about group policies yet, so we can't really explain this fully. OUs are used to assign different rights and permissions to different users, just like groups can be, but in a different order. So it's more... Instead of organizing, it's to organize in managerial yep. units. They're administrative that, boundaries. Administrative boundaries. That, that's a better way to put this, is to create administrative boundaries. Yes. So what you would do is you would create an OU, add your resources to it, and then take your admin of those people, associate it to that OU. Otherwise, to create kind of more a logical structure, that's where we use groups. Yep. And I was going to say, it could be used as a, you mentioned a user, it can be used as an administration bound, an, an administrative boundary in that context as well, in that you can delegate the management of the objects in that OU to someone else. Correct. So, Correct. Yeah, we'll talk about group policies. There's more to come in that, in that regard. Oh, it's demo dolly time. Oh, is Christopher it? is our demo dolly, creating users, groups, and OUs. All right, well, I have plenty of demos for that. And I have up on my screen. So what I have right now, 
I'm gonna bring up the default view. This is Windows Server 2012. You may be working with 2008. Hopefully you're not working with 2003. If you are, talk to a Microsoft certified partner about getting you up to 2012 R2, which is awesome. So no matter what server you're using, the concepts are the same. They are. This, this, the steps and tasks may be a little different, but conceptually this works no matter what server well, version. I'm, I'm gonna be extra nice and I'm gonna use both the 2008, 2003 version of the tools and the new 2012 version of the tools to do some of these demos. So you'll see the differences. So we start off with Active Directory users and computers. Um, launching these tools, we're not gonna go into the finer details of this. Again, there are some 80 fundamentals courses in MVA that really cover the, the nitty gritty of getting these tools open, getting to certain points and doing these things. I'm just gonna go through this kind of quickly. This is a default view of a domain in Active Directory users and computers. There's a users folder or container already here to create a new user. And this is where Microsoft, depending on your perspective, is terrific or terrible. I can right click, new user. Or I can right click, new user. Or I can click new user. So there, or I can click file. There's multiple ways to perform any given action. And at this point, it's kind of personal. What tastes better to yeah, you? Yeah, exactly. And I'll make a, a, another comment about actually that in just a second once I'm done with this demo. Creating a new user, relatively straightforward. First name, last name, user logon name. This, uh, this at Christopher.working, this is my default domain name right now, Christopher.working. It's a domain, domain I created. I can create other uh, suffixes for what are called UPNs, user principal names, to let people log in. For example, myself personally, I host some other domains on an email server and on web servers. I have to create user accounts in my domain for those people to access those resources, but I don't want to have to give them complicated usernames or even the, the pre-Windows 2000 login names with the domain name backslash. So I can actually create suffixes that are the same as their email or web domains, and they can log in with essentially their email addresses. But we won't go to, again, that's all. That's, it's possible. Create a password. Make sure they match. If they don't, there's no warning at this stage. So user must change password, next, problem. So let's fix it. And again, you've got some policies right here. Must change, cannot change, never expires or disabled. And we're done, I've created a user. There it is. Seems pretty straightforward. Relatively, yeah. I'm gonna just for the sake of demo, do another one, copy. And in this case, there's not too much point to the copy because they're the same user with no additional rights privileges. Ooh, that time I actually didn't do that on purpose. So now I have two users, that's done. I want to create a group. Same thing, right click new group or up here on the container, new group. Oops, not a contact, new group. Group name, I'm gonna actually give this something a little bit more useful, IT. Scope and type, I'm not gonna go into scope, this is for enterprises that may have multiple domains, possibly multiple trees and forests within their domain or within their organization. But group type does matter, security and distribution are different in that a security group can be used for security. I can use it to assign file permissions. I can use it to assign share permissions. I cannot use a distribution group to assign permissions. I can only use distribution groups to send emails out to large groups of people at one time. However, I can use a security group as a distribution group. So now, a security group has more functionality than it, a distribution group. It does. And a lot of people would think, well, if it does both, why would I ever have distribution groups? I'd just create security groups and I have the added benefit of them being security principles. Why wouldn't I do that? Well, this goes back to what we talked about in the beginning of the course least in module privilege. one, least privilege. I'm not gonna create groups that could by any means, even accidentally be assigned 
security permissions on something that shouldn't be or can't be or doesn't need to be. So if I have a group that is purely for distribution, I'm not gonna give it even the ability to be assigned security rights in any way, shape, or form. But in this case, I did, I've created a security group. Now there's no one in it. You don't, you notice I didn't add anyone to it, I just created it. Members, add, and here I can do a search. Users one and two both come up with my little simple search. And I've added them both. Now they're both in the group. Now I'm not member of, you can add groups to groups. That's all I'm gonna say. We're not gonna go into any great detail on that. Again, it's more advanced Active Directory information. So that's done. Users, groups, what else am I demoing? Am I getting a group policy on uh, this one? Create an OU and move users and a group to OU. All right, well, let's do that. So you'll notice I just have users. There's nothing else here. Well, first of all, why would we create another OU? Well, that's what I'm getting to. So I only have two users and one group in this, in this container. Now, the first stage, I have all of these, these weird groups in here that aren't, I didn't create them. Default. These are the, default, the default groups. groups. They're created by Windows. They're created by sometimes Exchange, share, different, different uh, software suites from different vendors. As you vendors add produce. role services onto the server that have additional functionality. You may get more groups and may, users. You may get more groups and users to help administrate those new roles and services. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a new role service, Exchange. Well, you need people who can use that service. Well, and typically, I'm not going to modify these. So right away, I have an administrative boundary actually to demonstrate what we talked about with OUs. I'm not gonna move these users and group out just because I want to see them in their own folder. It's not a great reason, but I want to create a new organizational unit because I wanna secure those resources. And I'm doing this the simple way I'm just dragging and dropping. Now there is a warning. Moving objects can prevent your existing system from working the way it was designed. We're gonna get into group policy a little bit later, so we'll get to that. They've been moved. So now I have one OU that's just for my users and groups that I've created that I'm using on my enterprise network. And the reason this would be a, a, a potential valid thing to do, as opposed to it just being organizational, this is administrative. I'm gonna apply group policies to these users I may have people I delegate to managing these users. So that's an OU, it's again, simple right click, new. Now, one of the problems with Active Directory or some Microsoft technologies is it's very easy to do stuff. I've now created two users, a group and an OU, and I've moved those users and group to an OU pretty simply. If I was really just sitting here doing it, it takes me two, three minutes without really knowing anything about the potential implications of that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about group policy later, which is the whole point of these OUs. For me, this is what the boundaries are for. Delegation and control, as much as I hate to say it that way. So that's it, users, groups, and OUs so far. We'll be back for more demos. Okay. Christopher, thank you for that excellent demo. I do what I can. Now let's talk about authorization. So authorization, rights and permissions. Rights allow you to perform an action of some kind. Uh, rights are assigned through local policies or Active Directory group policies, and they enable actions such as, I can log on locally to my system, as opposed to, I can log on remotely to my system. I can back up files. Those, so those are rights. Permissions define the type of access granted to an object. Uh, and this is kept track using an ACL, an access control list, which lists all users and groups that have access to the object. So maybe the ability to manage an object, maybe the ability to delete, create, the ability to read or write an object. Mm -hmm. So there, there's different permissions that allow you to perform different functions. Yep. NTFS. NTFS is the, it says the preferred file system to be used in today's operating systems. Uh, Christopher and I were talking about the new. There are some new options in Windows Server 2012, 2012 R2. NTFS is still very prevalent. It's going to be for quite some time. So that's why it's here. Um, and to bring, a, the, the content kind of jumps a little bit here. 
we've gone from users and groups in AD to rights and permissions as a definition. Having rights allows you to do certain things. Permissions allow you to, I'm trying to think of what the, I learned a kind of a catchphrase at one point for the difference between the two. Um, but I can't remember what it was, so I'll move past that. But we've moved into users and groups we created. Rights and permissions are things we can assign to those users and groups. We move to, I'm totally blanking here, NTFS. NTFS is a file system where we store data, where we assign rights and permissions to those users and groups. The slide doesn't really talk much about NTFS and, and what it is, it just says NTFS. Here's NTFS. It's a file system. It's where we're storing the files that we're going to grant rights and permissions to users within. Well, first of all, we had DOS. DOS had the FAT allocation table um, or the FAT file system. The issue with that is it was very single uh, user oriented. Uh, it didn't enable for permissions of any type. Really, it, it had some attributes in the system. Uh, but the FAT system, kind of once you were on the system, you had full access yep. to it. NTFS was more a multi-user oriented system. So now you have the ability to, Christopher has certain rights to a file on a system, I have certain rights to a file on a system, uh, we don't have rights to these areas of the system. So NTFS allows finer, more granular control for a multi-user system. NTFS permissions, uh, there are two types of permissions used in NTFS. Explicit permission and inherited. Explicit says, so at a file level, folder or a file, I have explicit permissions to this that say I can read, I can write, I can create, I can do whatever explicitly given. Versus inherited. Inherited says somewhere up here in the file system, a folder, uh, have been given permissions, uh, read, write. So down that hierarchy, down that structure, I have those same permissions unless an explicit permission was given. Effective permissions are basically the aggregate or the coming together of your explicit and your inherited permissions. Now we're at another demo, assigning user rights and NTFS permissions. Take it away, Christopher. That's funny, I'm actually, I'm building this out right now as we talk. All right, so. Let me create one more thing real fast, and then we'll jump right onto this desktop text. So I've got my desktop set up. I've got two folders. Folder one has a couple of documents and a subfolder in it. Folder two, I haven't put anything into yet. Let me create mm -mm, another document. Text four. Text four. There we go. So I've got these users, user one, user two, I've got a group. Folder one, we're gonna go into properties. All of your security options are in the properties of these things. I just realized I didn't show another tool in the last demo. I may have to do another demo after this. Okay. Right click properties, security is the tab we're looking for for right now. Full control, so system, administrator, and administrators. You'll notice this is gray. It's gray because if I click advanced, See, this says disable inheritance. These are inherited permissions. The desktop folder is actually just a subfolder in a hierarchy. It's right here. C users, administrator, desktop. So that means that there are four folders above my desktop, administrator, users, C, and the computer, which we won't really count in this case. It starts at C that could potentially be controlling permissions. I want to change this, so I'm going to hit edit and add user one. Now, in this case, users as a group, as, an, as, a, as a group or as a, I can't think of a better way to put it without using the word group, which is an actual technological term we're trying to use, don't have access to this by default, it's just me. So by adding user one, the default read and execute list contents and read, means this user now has essentially access to this folder. Well, and notice that? that that had little check boxes and stuff indicating mm -hmm. that that was a direct association of permissions as opposed to inherited. Yeah, so permission. now that I'm here, I look at user one, notice they're black instead of gray. 
I have explicitly defined these permissions for this user on this object, which is folder one. Now to further demonstrate inheritance, if I come into folder one, let's look at the properties of folder two, or subfolder one rather. User one's here with gray check marks in their permissions. So at this level, they're inherited. Yep. Uh, and that's really the best demonstration of assigning rights and inheritance versus explicit. Now there is one rule. If I do this, yeah, this should do what I want it to do. This isn't quite gonna be the demo I want because I should, oh, no, let's do this. I have a better example. So user one's here. User one is inheriting read list and, and read permissions. I'm gonna add the group. What did I call it? IT. IT. You can tell I'm practicing these demos day in and day out. I'm going to deny modify for IT of subfolder one. This gives you a very good warning. You're setting a deny permissions entry. Deny entries take precedence over allow entries. This means that if a user is a member of two groups, one that is allowed a permission and another that is denied the same permission, the user is denied. Typically, and we're gonna get in, I'm gonna try and talk about this without getting too much in depth. If you have the same user in multiple groups and those groups have different permissions to the same resource, folder, file, those permissions are cumulative. If one group gives me read and one group gives me write, I have read and write. That's how it works. If I'm using deny permissions, that column on the right, those rules do not apply. Deny overrides. Deny takes precedence. It always takes precedence. So I could be in 10 groups and I could have read, write, modify, full control. I could have all the control in the world. If I get put into an 11th group and then I deny full control in that 11th group, nothing else matters. Something you have to be very cautious of. And really the rule of thumb, don't use this. I mean, it's 90% of the time. I've never actually been on a network where we needed to explicitly deny permissions. The absence of permissions, and no, that's not security by obscurity, just not adding this group. So user two is in the IT group. If I don't add IT, user two does not have access to this. I don't have to deny the group right, for user two to not have it. And that's typically how user directories work, is users get associated explicit permissions to the user directories. Others don't, so they're unable to access each other's user directories. Exactly. So that covers users, groups, permissions. We've got inheritance. You showed effective We've permissions. Got explicit. You showed explicit. Yep. I think you kind of covered it I all. think I got it. I think we got it all here for now. Yeah. Let us continue. Folder share. So as a user wants to work with content over the network, they don't typically log on to the server and modify the server. Instead, they access a folder share. A folder share allows them access to resources and content. And you use the permissions that we just talked about to address unauthorized access. Those that need access, we give permissions. Those that don't need access, we don't give permissions. Uh, to access a uh, share, we use a UNC. Uh, and that's typically a WAC WAC server name, WAC share name path. Uh, another demo, a sharing a folder demo. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Sharing a folder uh, and then, to, oh, and then talk about combining share permissions with NTFS permissions. <laughs> this is one of the greatest conversations in IT when you're learning out, especially getting new to security. I love having this conversation. But I gave all the permissions. I still can't access it. Yeah, we're going to get to that. So sharing, we're only going to sort of be able to look at Well, we'll be able to look at it. I can do it from one computer. I'm gonna use folder two for this. And we're gonna just start right off with sharing. One of the nice things about some of the newer versions, share with, right here at the top. Specific people, and it just gives me user one, add. Now there's a permission level right here. This is essentially a, a simplified interface for sharing, or a simplified interface for really anything permissions related. You've seen this, I'm giving user one read permission, great, share. It's done. It tells me what I've done. 
You can email someone links or copy and paste links to another program. I'm not going to worry about that. Now, what we used to do back when I was a kid. Back in the day. You would go to properties and there's a sharing tab and there's advanced sharing. And this looks just like here. These are a little bit different. Notice this interface is not what we saw for the NTFS permissions. These ones look the same. Advanced sharing, share this folder. Folder two and permissions. And this starts to look a little familiar. Right now, everyone has read permissions. Now, sharing means exactly that. I'm allowing other users access to this data on this server, on this network. By default, when I do that, this is what happens. Everyone, which is a, a security principle in Windows, gets read permissions. And I can just click OK, and I'm good. I'm done. So what happens if I, as a user, have connected to that share, and I want to write to it? Am I going to be able to write to it, even though I have the NTFS permission to write to well, it? Well, we'll hold off on that, because we're going to okay. get to those NTFS permissions and how those apply. Okay. So right now, I have folder two with this one document. It is technically shared with everyone with read permissions. But if I go to the actual permissions for folder two, and I look at the security permissions, everyone's not in here. Everyone has no access to this folder. And I'm using everyone in the security principle sense so that my pronoun antecedents are not conflicting. Uh, user one does have access, an administrator has access. Um, give me just a moment. That's what I thought. It showed me in that last screen, but I don't want to go back to that last screen. So if I pull up this server using a UNC path, I get folder two. I'm administrator. I have access to folder two and its contents. User two does not. Even though everyone has share permissions, he'd be able to see it, or she would be able to see it if they did that same whack whack server DC. They'd be able to see folder two here. And notice the folders are represented a little bit differently with the basically kind of the network indication there, that little line with the green on it, indicating that you're accessing this remotely yep. as opposed to locally. Yep. So when you access something locally, it's on the hard drive on the system you're working on or attached to your system somehow. Remotely means it's connected to a different machine or you're accessing a different device. Yep. So we come back into folder two properties. To get this to share out with everyone, I have to, again, advance sharing permissions, and I have to give them, or I have to give them security. Actually, give me just a second. I'm gonna do two different things. Because of the different interface for sharing, I've already shared this out. With user one as read. Now you'll notice, and this is where things get a little tricky. These interfaces are different and their results are different. You'll see here there is no everyone and there is no read for everyone. If I come back into that other screen, sharing, advanced, there isn't everyone. There's not a user one, which I applied in that other screen. If we come back into here, and I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but it is kind of tricky. If I change this, or even if I add IT, share. Now, oh, notice it's the same, server DC folder two. But they don't show up in the same place. They're not inclusive of each other's lists for some strange reason. Well, if, if we break this down and think about it for a minute, you've given every, okay, you, the computer automatically gives everyone the read permission for the share. So as you browse the network, the share is available mm -hmm. and you can see it. That doesn't mean you can do anything with it. That doesn't mean you can get in there and touch it or manage it or anything, but that's just a method that as you create a share, 
users on the network can see the share. Then you have to give explicit permissions to get in and work with the share. And this is where I'll give a pointer. When I created this, everyone has read permissions. I'm going to leave that, although you may go change. But I'm not going to change the everyone. And the reason for that is, after this is done, I'm going to close sharing, and I'm going to go to security. Because like I said, user 1 and IT have permissions here. If I take one of these out, let's remove IT. Even though everyone can read the share, IT no longer has NTFS permissions. They won't actually be able to open it. I have to worry now about having two different lists of access control, share and NTFS. The rule of thumb, generally speaking, especially on small to medium networks where these things are pretty manageable, leave your NTFS permissions as, as loose as you can. Or I'm sorry, I'm getting that backwards. Don't listen to me. Share permissions, relatively open. Use NTFS to narrow down and actually be specific. Because NTFS applies to the files locally and remotely. Whereas the share only applies if they're to another computer. So you could get caught by cranking down your share permissions, and then somebody gains access to the system locally. They have more permissions. And they're not impacted by Potentially, those. Potentially, yep. So keep share permissions relatively broad, narrow it down in NTFS permissions. What's fun is when you combine the two. I'm in two groups. One group has read to NTFS. The other group has write share. What's the result? So write share. So at that point, only write. Well, OK. So. It depends on how you're accessing it. If you're accessing it remotely, you get write, because that was the share permission. But remember, they have NTFS read permissions. But if so they have read on the NTFS and write in the share. Correct. So if they're accessing it remotely, all they have is write from the share. But NTFS is more restrictive. You said they had read write. No, on just the... read. Oh, 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 oh. Just I, read. I, I misheard. I thought you said read write. So on the share, they have read-write. Yep. On the NTFS, they have read. So you look at those and how they, so it basically write, read, and read. When they come together, you lose the write. Well, what happens is the two, unlike file permissions where they combine, or share permissions where they combine, if you're in multiple groups with different permissions, NTFS and shares are separate systems. They don't talk to each other. They don't know about each other's shares and permissions and ACLs. So they just apply what they know. If I log in, the share says I have read write. The share goes, cool, you have read write. NTFS goes, you don't have write. I don't know about this share. I don't even know how you're getting to this. All I know is I'm the file system. You're trying to get to a file on this file system. All I see is read. That's all you get to do. So they're not cumulative. They're going to be least restrictive. So file permissions combined. They're cumulative, and you end up with the least restrictive. Share permissions combine multiple groups, and you end up with the least restrictive. File versus share permissions do not combine, and you end up with the most restrictive. And something, as you're dealing with creating structures, <clears throat> either your Active Directory structures or your file system structures, uh, planning your security can take quite a while. Yes, it, I mean, th it this should is a whole, take quite a while. Yes. I'll say it should take yeah, quite a while. Yeah, this is a whole big process that you need to go to for protecting your files appropriately and protecting your directory structure yep. appropriately. I think that's it. Was that just, we were sharing, right? Share permissions? Yeah, that was, that was it. Making sure, making sure I covered all the bases. Yep. Auditing. Radius and Terminal Access Controller, Access Control System Plus are two protocols that provide centralized authentication, authorization, and accounting management for computers to connect and use a network service. They reside on a remote system and respond to queries from clients such as VPN, Virtual Private Network, Wireless Access Points, Routers, and Switches. The server then authenticates a username password combination authentication, determine if a user is allowed to connect to the client authorization, and then log the connection through auditing, which is accounting. 
Auditing allows you to track the users who have logged in and what the user accessed or tried to access. Syslog is a standard for logging program messages that can be accessed by devices that would not otherwise have a method for communication. This is auditing can kind of be a dual-edged sword. Uh, if you turn on auditing, you need to be careful what you audit. If you audit too much, this can fill your hard drive quite quickly. So as you audit, uh, I would just warn you to take forethought and really plan out your auditing system before you just blanket turn all auditing on. It can get quite uh, big quite quickly. Uh, there's a demo, there another is. demo here, file this, system auditing. And this takes us through a couple of different things all at once. Rule number one with Windows, I can audit anything anytime. I can, let me rephrase, I can tell Windows to audit anything at any time. So right here, I'm on general. I've got sharing, I've got security. Um, I can, within security, <coughs> pardon me, I'm sorry. There's an advanced tab and there's an auditing tab. And I'm going to add for any user, let's say for everyone, which works, I want to see, I, I don't need to be too depth. I just want to see when they read, when they're looking at things in this folder. Done. Now click OK and OK. Done. Auditing is, is enabled. A couple of questions come up right away. One, where does that go? Where do I look that information up? That information is kept right here in the event viewer, which you may or may not be familiar with. And in here, there are Windows logs, and one of those is security. Well, and there's different logs for different types of auditing. Yes. Security now, events. Before I get too far into this, though, I want to qualify it. That folder that I just selected everyone and turned on read and clicked OK, nothing's going to show up here. Nothing at all will show up in the audit log because there's a prerequisite that you that, that the OS doesn't make you aware of right away. You have to enable auditing on the computer before auditing actually works. And it tells you right here, audit policy changes, audit policy changes. This is no domain controller, so some auditing is already turned on. In addition to telling the server what to audit, which I just did, what to audit and for who, I have to actually tell it to enable auditing in the first place. I've gone a step ahead and I've already created a, an MMC console with local computer policy. We're not going to go into great detail. All you need to know is that using group policy, I have to allow auditing before anything's going to matter. Object access, no auditing. So the fact that I created everyone read in the auditing tab doesn't mean anything. It's not going to show up. I would have to actually turn this on. Now it will work after I refresh this, which is another conversation. So turn on auditing in group policy, set up auditing or enable auditing on your objects, in this case, the folder on the desktop, and then that information will be kept in the security log of the computer or server. And that's pretty much a short version. So again, just one more quick refresher to get to it, security, advanced tab or advanced button. That's where you get to auditing. I think that's it. That's it. Okay, so let's talk about encryption. Encryption is a process of converting data into a different format that cannot be read by another user. Once a user is encrypted a file, it automatically remains encrypted when the file is stored on a disk. Decryption is the process of converting data from the encrypted format back to its original format. A key, similar to a password in nature, is applied mathematically to the text to provide a cipher or encrypted text. Yep. Public key infrastructure, PKI, is a system consisting of hardware, software, policies, and procedures to create, manage, distribute, use, store, and revoke digital certificates. I think that's actually a direct, I'm assuming that's, uh, that's actually Microsoft's official definition of PKI, because I have that in two other slide decks that I've used in MBA in the I last do? year, yeah. So I'm learning that definition verbatim <laughs> at this point. 
So within PKI, the Certificate Authority, commonly referred to as the CA, binds a public key with respective user identities and issues digital certificates containing the public key. Certificate Revocation List, CRL, is a list of certificates, or more specifically, a list of serial numbers for certificates that have, not, or that have been revoked and are no longer valid. Forms of encryption, and these are for different types of access. Yeah, all these are different for different things, different activities. Sure, so SSL, secure socket layers for web requests, for mm -hmm. HTTP. Secure multi-purpose internet mail extensions, S M I M E. You say mine, S mine. I, I wasn't. I was gonna go there, but I'm not. Yeah, not I, I, any, that's that's why I was just, yeah, gestures. that's that's why I was just gonna spell it out for email, <laughs> PGP for email files, basically data. Lots of things. Yep. Uh, encrypting file system for a file system, BitLocker for a hard drive. Mm -hmm. And then VPN. VPN is for data over the network. Uh, we have a demo. We do indeed. To encrypt files over the network. And I can use this. So keep that last slide up because I may come back to that slide as I do this demo. So I'm already in here. I'll wait till they, there we go. Awesome. Got folder two up. Got text four on the screen. Actually very simple. Right click. Properties. Now you don't see anything about encryption anywhere on here. Your first thought may be to go to security. It's not the place we do encrypting. It's actually right here under attributes. Encrypt contents to secure data. Click OK and OK. It asks me if I want to do the file and the folder. So if you're encrypting a file that is in an unencrypted folder, or I am, it's telling me, if this file is modified, the editing software might store a temporary unencrypted copy of the file. So I won't demonstrate that. Uh, a good example, if you want to learn about this, turn on the, or the ability to see hidden files, encrypt a Word document, open it in Word, and look in the directory. Because Word or most Office applications actually create a temporary version of that document in the same directory to do your work on. And that's what they're talking about right here. So here we're going to encrypt the file and its parent folder. I'll go ahead and do that because it's fine. There's no risk. It turned green and is encrypted. That's, that's the short version. I could, as long as I'm accessing this file, I can get to it. I can move it around. I can do anything I want with it. If someone else tries to get to it, they can't. Uh, if someone else takes it off this computer, they won't be able to open it. Now, the difference, the reason I kept that prior slide up, if we can go back to the slide from the deck, those last two, or the two of the last three, EFS and BitLocker, I just demonstrated EFS, which is encrypting a single file, or a file and a folder. In fact, if I go up one level, you'll see folder two is also green, because I chose to do that. BitLocker is whole drive encryption. It sits above, so to speak, the hard drive and covers the whole hard drive. Encrypts it all. And typically you get a vis visual representation when you look uh, in File Explorer. You'll see the drive and then you'll see a little, uh, a little lock, lock yep. by it. Yep. And that's it. That's our, that's our demo for encryption. It's actually pretty straightforward in Windows. Right click, right on the general tab, click advanced in the lower right, check the box to encrypt contents, and you're done. This brings us to the end. Awesome. Additional resources, next steps. Again, uh, Microsoft.com slash learning, yep. a great uh, area to find additional resources. It is indeed. And again, all these, all the other MTA courses, if you have or haven't taken them, there are courses, five-day, three-day, uh, instructor-led hands-on courses. There are the exams, this exam, as well as the other three in this, in this sort of genre. And then the 410, for, uh, 410 course and exam as the first step to the Microsoft Certified Systems Administrator certification and let me let me address to talk about let me address one thing here uh, I, I am periodically I periodically receive the question of how do I know that I've properly prepared for a test if you go to microsoft.com uh, slash learning and look at the exam that you're prepping for at this point it's uh, 98367 you look at the exam and then look at what's referred to as the objective domain these are basically the concepts that are going to be on the test. So just ensure that you understand the concepts associated with the objective domain for the test 
And at that point, you should be properly prepared to take the test. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think that's I, it for module two. I think two. that's yeah, it. I think we're... I think we're module two done. Yeah, so we'll be back in a, well, we won't be, but we're, we're just sitting in the next we, module on your page. We'll, we'll just be here. We're just one down. You yeah. may or may not be back sometime in the near future. We hope you're going to be back. We do. There's more knowledge to be had.